So what we've got is essentially a combined effort between our two universities here to talk about winter damage or winter kill. It's been another interesting uh, winter to this point in time. Uh, here recently we warmed back up today in Blacksburg. We're once again back into a winter period with some uh, freezing rain and drizzle this morning. But our goals today are to assess what damage we think has happened, and then really emphasize some strategies in pre- and post-emergent weed control. And then as we finalize everything this morning to talk about what are our steps for recovery. So my colleagues know to chime in at any point with anything they have to see. Some of these slides came directly from them. Others will just kind of work our way through here to see what we can do. But we want to give you a, a feel for what the academics are thinking in terms of what maybe has happened this winter and perhaps what to expect this spring. So what are you thinking about in terms of winter kill at this point in time? And I just put some pictures in here from previous examples of uh, damage that's happened. And in the top left, okay, from a golf course from just a few years ago, uh, again, we see the classic uh, shade line where probably that turf stayed frozen. We also see standing water, and through this presentation, you're going to hear some of my colleagues talk a little bit about the importance of, of crown hydration. In the middle picture there, uh, which is a very clearly, say middle, top right, is a very clearly defined image of something in the middle where the damage has occurred. That is Tech's football practice field, which is Bermuda grass. And what we're seeing there is the central portion of the field had been replaced that previous fall with uh, Tipway 419. And uh, the outside perimeter is latitude 36. And the genetics are in play, clearly in place there, because 419 in Blacksburg is always very hit and miss in terms of winter survival. The left center picture is at the University of Virginia. Uh, Bermuda grass baseball field there, and again, what we're seeing is a combination of uh, cold winter and uh, lots and lots of traffic. And then, Dr. Miller, I know this picture on the bottom right is one that you put in, and it's got just a little bit different angle here about winter kill damage. Yeah, I was just going to, you know, point out that we typically see more problems on north-facing slopes. They uh, stay colder longer. South facing slope sometimes see very little damage. So this golf course shot, I thought, you know, illustrated that pretty well. It does very well. So these are all our usual suspects. And of course, a big part of it is uh, is cold temperature. Grady, I think that was one more that I pulled from your set there. And I, I, I'm going to bet that's probably something to do with drainage. Yeah, this lack of drainage where it stays frozen longer. And that's where we often see, you know, combinations of stresses uh, that will, you know, result in more winter kill or more death. So we figure everybody probably has a pretty good idea on what the heck it is that we're, or where we're going to be seeing these things. Dr. Gannon, I think maybe this might have come from your presentation, sir, if you want to cover a little bit about this. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's there's been a fair amount of work done, uh, and Grady, uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Excuse me, Gately can speak to this um, uh, better than I can, but there's been a fair amount of work done. This is just a slide I've been using in presentations comparing the relative cold tolerances of, of different types of Bermuda grass. And again, there's some, as you'll note here, these are in, these are midpoints of lethal temperatures to get 50% uh, death, if you will. And this work, it should also be noted, this was done at Oklahoma State. And what this gives us is a is a relative difference among cultivars, and as you'll note, there's there there are differences, but not uh, widely ranging differences. And I'll also note that, um, and I'd be interested to hear what the folks at Virginia Tech have to say. But we we've, we've monitored it pretty closely uh, in the Raleigh area, and I have not seen temperatures below 31.5 degrees. Having said that, those are taken at the four inch depth in the soil profile, whereas these, this, uh, the data uh, on this slide here and some of the other work is taken in the one to 1 1.5 inch depth. So it's not a direct comparison or just because, you know, we haven't had anything below 31.5 degrees in Raleigh doesn't mean that winter kill won't be an issue, but it, Again, those temperatures that we've monitored in Raleigh, they're at the four-inch depth, which is obviously different than 
uh, one to one and a half inch depth. Grady, do you have anything to add there? Uh, well, one thing I will add, and, and then we're going to talk about assessing winter damage a little bit later, but I did pull some plugs out of a Champion Green and a Mini Verde Green, and uh, one was covered and one was not covered, and I'm not sure if we can see these or not. Maybe if I uh, tilt my camera here, uh, you can see the green, uh, two of the plugs, those were a Mini Verde Green, and the plug on the side here with nothing growing in it was a, was a Champion Green. So whether that means anything or not, certainly some differences in regrowth, which would okay. be the same as the temperatures that you, uh, you know, the relative differences you see in that, that table. Right. And we look back at this table and where we've gone. So for me, I still use this one too, Trev, especially to talk about those putting green uh, midpoint temperatures that kill over there. But our releases of recent grasses uh, now, especially for us up uh, further into the transition zone with Northbridge and uh, Latitude 36, uh, Patriot. Uh, we've been watching OKC uh, 1131 really extensively up here as a, a new one coming to market that the genetics certainly has a lot to do with this in terms of choosing. And Grady, I know this is one you put in and this moves away from the world of Bermuda grasses, but goes into zoysias. Right, and, and these are temperatures in, uh, in centigrade, uh, I'm skewing Celsius rather than Fahrenheit, but yeah, you know, we did some work with some of the newer zoysia grasses a few years back and subjecting those plugs. Uh, they were field acclimated or unacclimated, which we have a slide later showing the differences, uh, but just as a way of evaluating tolerance. And you can see the pristine, which is in the lower right, uh, very little regrowth, something like Xeon, much more, and Jammer much more than, than Diamond. So, so certainly genetics play a big role in this uh, response. Grady, this was your comment here about acclimated versus non-acclimated, which this is always one that especially comes in with ultra dwarfs in terms of when do we use covers, do we let them go uh, into dormancy and trying to play that game. So I'll let you, this is zoysia grass, but I'll let you give a brief comment on this one, please, sir. Yeah, this was actually two years of data. So these are means of two years, and it was it was pretty consistent both years. And what you're looking at here are zoysia grasses, some of the finer textured as well as the coarser textured zoysias. And we took plugs that were, like I said, field acclimated, growing uh, out in the weather, and ran the LT lethal temperatures uh, on those plugs uh, in, a, in a chamber, and you can see a much lower temperature for winter runs, and in the spring runs, they had started greening up uh, to some extent, but they were still in the field, pulled those out, subjected them to the same sort of treatments. You can see it's much easier to kill uh, unacclimated uh, grasses than it is, you know, winter acclimated grasses, and we like to point out that often what we call as winter kill is, is spring kill, and we often see some of our worst damages uh, in the spring, which we still haven't gotten to the spring yet. So we, we still have a lot of opportunities uh, after now to have damage, uh, even though we may see some damage already this year. So one of our ways, and, and Grady, I know this slides from you and anyone in the golf world that's growing ultra dwarfs is very familiar, but we also have many athletic field managers doing this as well is the value of covers in terms of uh, protection. And, and uh, we've even had, though, here in Virginia with our ultra dwarf greens graded that uh, the greens have been frozen underneath covers in the Richmond area. So this doesn't ensure that the soils won't freeze, but in most cases still I feel pretty comfortable that when the covers have been applied that we've got uh, living grass underneath. Yeah, you know, I don't really have anything more to add than that other than just to remind people that covers are beneficial and it's, it's a good insurance. And I put this one in just because, again, the things that you see, Dick Schultz from down in Georgia gave me this slide and said, do you think a cover can work? And he's like, even the flag stick where it happened to be laying on this green, this one particular event, uh, something was in place there that protected that turf. So it wouldn't take a whole heck of a lot in order to do something. So, yeah, I mean, remembering uh, Dr. Gannon's uh, table earlier, and there there weren't large numbers. You know, we were looking at 19s versus 22, and you say, oh, it's not a big difference. But when you think about the buffering capacity of the soil, that can be a big difference uh, in fluctuating air temperatures. 
uh, that can that can allow a Bermuda grass to move much further north than uh, one that would uh, be less susceptible, just a few degrees in, in difference in the soil temperature. Here we're looking at daily air temperatures. Uh, from the winter event that's got us so worried, uh, uh, we've compiled uh, the weather data from Raleigh, uh, Richmond, and Blacksburg. And, you know, you're looking at uh, near, at least for air temperatures, highs that are at or below 32 degrees for a period of seven days with minimal snow cover there in Raleigh. And when you look at the amount of snow we had during this event, uh, I know uh, in some areas we got more than, than others, but when you don't have uh, more than an inch of snow, you're not getting a whole lot of insulation from that. So in Richmond, they got more snow than, than most of us. From Richmond to the coast, uh, got appreciable amount of snow during this period. Uh, and they had about eight days of uh, below 32 degree temperatures with reasonable snow. This is Willow Oaks Country Club back in 2010. I would argue that this year uh, they had substantially more snow than that. Um, and I think they got up to eight, eight inches on the coast. Uh, well, Jordan Booth has now joined us here. Jordan's the latest, the newest Virginia Tech employee now working at our Independence Golf Club Research. So this was home base for you, uh, Richmond being home base now. How much snow have you gotten so far this year? We've got about eight inches over a couple different events. Um, and, but it was it, most of it happened during that really cold. That's right. right yeah, now. I think the snows were pretty timely this year, yeah, which yeah. is nice. Right when it got the coldest, um, you know, we did have some substantial snow cover that that hasn't eased the uh, concerns of a lot of folks growing right. Bermuda grass in Central Virginia. But um, I think I think that would have been the best case scenario is to have snow cover when it got so low. But it was limited to the coastal edges. Uh, we didn't we didn't we didn't get any, and and then. Some other areas got minimal. And the snow cover has been, uh, and, and Grady and Travis, you all provide this, what Sean's got here, but in all my years of playing around with the different sources of covers, and especially since coming back to Blacksburg and what I see when we do get more snow here than I did when I was in the deep south, if I get the covers basically covered in snow, uh, it uh, basically locks that temperature up. And my most recent set of data that we just got published showed that if we had snow cover, of an inch or greater that that temperature underneath there, even on nights when we're getting close to uh, six, seven degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature stayed within one degree of freezing at that point. So it doesn't take a heck of a lot of snow in that type of situation to really provide a lot of insulation. In Blacksburg, I think we were among the hardest hit. I know uh, you look at Arlington, Virginia, and the data is almost exactly the same here, except that our Low temperatures dipped a little lower than theirs, but otherwise uh, we both were dealing up in Northern Virginia and Blacksburg with approximately 11 days of at or below freezing uh, temperatures. And so, you know, that's going to cause concern and for anyone. No snow cover here. That yeah, was and our no, challenge. no snow. All we had was trace snow events, just a light dusting. Something that would. And, and I'll just. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, Charles. I'll just add to that, Dr. Askew, the, you know, as far as I'm, I mean, speaking from the Raleigh perspective, uh, and Grady, correct me on the numbers here, but we broke uh, the record for the number of hours below freezing, broke the all-time record, and it was like the, the existing one was like 149 hours or 150 hours, and I think we broke it by like 36 or maybe 40 hours. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're in, in, in the Raleigh area, in many parts of North Carolina, we're kind of in uncharted territory uh, as far as amount of time below freezing. So. It's, it, it will be interesting. Yeah, but it's questionable as to whether just that that period of below freezing temperatures are really what's at stake, or sure. let's just say is the most important component uh, in winter kill. So for those that did get snow cover, just remember that that snow cover was not uniform and it was and it was not consistent. Usually windswept areas, noses, uh, areas that tend to be more hydrated. Um, they're going to suffer from winter kill phenomenon more than other areas. Uh, the thing that you emailed me the other day, Dr. Goatley, uh, was interesting in that hydrated areas, when you do start getting sunlight, that solar energy is going to, to, to really uh, be held by the water in more hydrated areas. And we can see hydrated areas having snow melt much more rapidly than dry areas. Yeah, and all that uh, is things that we just kind of take for granted, but uh, soil moisture 
can both work for you and work against yes. you in these situations. It can work against you from the standpoint of hydrated areas tend to get more uh, crystal formation and they get more crown hydration. Uh, uh, and uh, but they also build up that solar energy. But then you have your your in this image, it's showing more of a windswept situation. It's probably a combination of uh, being windswept and uh, rapid uh, snow melt. And then when you get cold after these events, that's when those are the areas that are really going to suffer relative to the rest. So here's a uh, winter kill situation, and I, you guys are the experts, but I would argue lower height of cut turf is generally going to be more susceptible than taller height of cut. Sure. I guess it's over here not. Yeah. So that brings us into uh, one of Dr. Gannon's slides, uh, starting a little, you know, we want to kind of structure this presentation not just around winter kill, but around what are we going to do moving forward, especially from a weed control standpoint when we're worried about herbicides possibly interacting with uh, winter kill areas and causing us more problems down the road. Travis, you have something to say no. about that? Yeah, no, nothing in addition to the text. It's just, um, okay. You know, it's it's commonly uh, overlooked because everybody's concerned about getting their pre-emergent herbicides out timely. And you know, for those that aren't uh, using oxidizing or Monstar type products, uh, right. you know, we really really need to be thinking ahead because the extent, the amount of damage, and the extent of damage is not known when we're making these applications in many cases. So we. So right now I'm getting phone calls from everyone uh, related to glyphosate applications. And I think on, on the upside, most, most, most of our folks are definitely dormant enough this year because of the uh, winter weather that we've recently had. We're being hampered in our ability to get out right now with our uh, glyphosate sprays on dormant Bermuda and Zoysia because of the rainfall that we're having it, uh, but now would be a great time. We have this little warming spell this week, right after snow melt, and um, but we're it's it's kind of a challenge right now to get out on the turf. But I think we've got a little bit of time, and I would argue that deeper into the south, you guys probably have um, more dormant turf than you're accustomed to having. So, if if Travis, you want to comment on that, maybe real quick. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree, and I think the uh, I think you're exactly right. And you know, in most parts of North Carolina, now you get into the far southeast part of the state, uh, perhaps that's an exception. But you know, more years than not, we uh, I mean, people are nervous because they have a little bit of green tissue on the Bermuda grass. But uh, even if you have you know some green material, uh, if it's established Bermuda grass areas, you're not gonna uh, adversely affect it long term by uh, by making a glyphosate application. So again, the exception of that is the southeast corner of the state, and of course it's different when you get into South Carolina. But uh, yeah, we're I think it's the safest year we've had to apply glyphosate on Bermuda right. grass. But then the next question that we kind of I got us off track a little bit, but the other question that we were moving into is pre-emerge herbicides. We've got a we've got a question here from uh, Bruce Sutton. Now you guys are talking, I'm starting to get concerned about uh, winter kill because we already have our 007 with Ronstar scheduled. Well, uh, Bruce, I mean, Ronstar would be, a, for if you can afford it, would be a great thing to have scheduled this year uh, more so than any other. If you look at this uh, slide that we have up now, it's, it's showing reseeding restrictions for all of these herbicides, barricade, spectacle flow, and Ronstar flow, but also in the little boxes uh, superimposed over the bars, it's showing uh, what we could glean from the label in terms of resprigging or sodding. And notice that with Ronstar flow on the far right there, you don't have to wait uh, between application and sprigging or sodding. So if you did happen to suffer winter kill, Ronstar would certainly be the product of choice. And I think nowadays one thing that we have to worry about, we, we're going to get into this a little, uh, Dr. Gannon has some uh, research data and I do as well that we'll, or some images at least that we'll show. But spectacle flow is kind of changing the game because a lot of people are using that in, in a pattern that is more of a fall application to target both winter weeds as well as weeds in uh, step one the following spring or the first portion of the spring. And that kind of carryover can be of uh, considerable concern with spectacle. But we'll get into that in a little bit. But notice spectacle here on this graph, we're talking at the high rate, 12 months of um, 
a restriction prior to uh, seeding. So it's a little bit longer residual than some of the others. Yeah. Dr. Gannon, I believe this was one that came from your set, sir. Yes. So, uh, you know, just simplifying modes of actions of different uh, different herbicides that we, uh, pre-herbicides that we use today that are registered today. Um, you know, the, the differences uh, among the products, of course, the DNAs uh, and DIPO appear, although it's not a DNA, it has the same mode of action. So uh, they are mitotic inhibitors, uh, thereby affecting um, rooting and lateral spread and lateral recovery. So the implications of that are if we have winter damage or winter injury, then uh, you know, a DNA or a diphyopere is going to adversely affect lateral spread and recovery. Whereas to Dr. Askew's point just a few minutes ago, oxidize and of course, Ronstar type products, uh, you know, in, in, in years like this, that's going to be the, uh, the best treatment, uh, from a, from an all things considered standpoint. Of course, you have a, a cost component there that is problematic for some, uh, turf managers, but uh, Ronstar or oxidizing products, they only affect shoots, so they do not, they do not adversely affect um, uh, the lateral spread and recovery of, uh, of warm season turf species. And in diazoplam or spectacle, uh, it, it, it's got some shoot activity, but by and large, it, uh, it affects rooting. So again, if you have winter injury or stress from any type of um, uh, event, whether it be weather related or uh, shade or nematodes, again, that also uh, will affect, um, adversely affect lateral spread and recovery. All right, and a quick comment about Ronstar, that the fact that it only affects shoots is a major benefit during winter kill, but it also c becomes a challenge or at least something that we need to work with in, in, uh, in maximizing effectiveness of Ronstar. Ronstar is highly dependent on excellent coverage. The sprayable formulations tend to work better than the granular. You need a higher rate of the granular to achieve that that you can get from the sprayable, all because if uh, you don't have a uniform barrier with Ronstar, you're going to miss that little shoot when it's coming out of the soil, whereas root inhibitors, oftentimes the roots can explore and encounter the product and be inhibited somewhat. That's not going to happen with Ronstar. So Generally speaking, with a few exceptions, you don't cut the rates, you don't split applications of Ronstar, you put it out full slug up front and uh, try to get the best coverage you can. Uh, what you got here, uh, Dr. Gannon, just talking about the fact that Ronstar is going to be uh, the choice for sprigging or siding applications post winter kill? Right, just to reemphasize, you know, if you have uh, stress from any type of event in particular now, uh, winter injury, again, uh, oxidizant-based products are, you know, the product of choice if uh, if your budget allows. And that's and why also, they cover four times the cost of root inhibitors, generally speaking. Right. right. All right, we're going to try to uh, move on here. So you got a couple more points here, Dr. Gannon? Uh, there, we've already made them. We can yeah, cruise okay. through these. Okay. Well, this here is just a couple of images where we were looking at um, sprigging immediately after uh, different rates of barricade or perdiamine, just to look at how, what the effect would be at these rates. Now, one way to look at this is if you had applied a full rate of barricade, let's say you applied uh, 24 to 48 ounces, and you look at the dissipation rate in the soil, and that's certainly your expertise, Dr. Gannon, but you could argue that, say, one to two months later, you might be down to something like a one-tenth rate or 4.8 ounces. But anyway, applying 4.8 ounces and sprigging immediately after resulted in fairly good uh, stand establishment of latitude Bermuda grass 10 weeks after treatment. When we move up to 12 ounces of barricade, you can see bare ground even at 10 weeks after treatment. Here's 24 ounces, and there's 48 ounces. And so you, you can see easily how much these are going to inhibit the Bermuda. And this is, even when we saw visibly good-looking Bermuda, uh, what appeared to be uniform coverage of the latitude, you can see that rates beyond that 4.8 ounce of barricade substantially reduced the shear strength of the Bermuda grass Check toward the, the end of the season. Just came up there. Look that up. Here's a uh, dimension, uh, Dathiopir doing the same thing basically at, uh, as rates increase you can see that even though in some of those cases we had reasonably good looking turf we're 
drastically reducing the shear strength. Okay. See, I can read the question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. What effect will the deep freeze in late December and early January have on the various insect pests that plagued many turf areas in 2017? And I can only speak from listening to our entomologists give talks at recent conferences, and uh, our entomologist says, don't think this cold weather is going to have any significant in in influence on insect pests. Okay. That's, that's the words I've been hearing from our entomologist. Well, that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, dealing with these, if, if you have residual carryover from a pre-emerge herbicide, charcoal is definitely an option that you can use, but trust me, it's not a real fun option. We did some work uh, evaluating uh, how charcoal might reduce effects of um, prodiamine, and our two rates were 24 or 48 ounces, and it really didn't matter what the rate was. Uh, we found that for that particular herbicide, 150 to 200 pounds of charcoal per acre uh, would give you an establishment rate that was similar to non-treated turf. Uh, that's going to vary, though, depending on the product. Most charcoal rates uh, that are going to be recommended are between 300 and 600 pounds of product per acre, uh, which can be uh, bordering on $2,000 an acre at the high rate. And so, um, at least for barricade, we could cut that cost and uh, that rate substantially. Again, I've already mentioned about how much residual there is from Spectacle. It's been a very successful product in the Deep South. You can see here the, the range of broadleaf uh, we control as a pre-emerge that it's giving us in this trial. Uh, a, a excellent product, but can cause issues. Here's a trial that we conducted, and I know Dr. Gannon's gonna have some stuff coming up here in a moment. So in this case, you look at the date there, it's October 19th, uh, 2016. And this is what uh, the turf looked like at initiation. There was uh, scarcely any poannua, poannua present, but the purpose of the trial was to look at poannua control. And the product, as you all know, performed very well for poannua control. Here's the trial the following May, and everything surrounding it is poannua seed heads. And almost every spectacle treatment we put out did a great job. But the following June, now we, we started this thing in mid-October. That's when the spectacle was, was applied. The following June, we killed half of all the plots with Roundup to simulate a winter kill situation. So the plan was to kill half the plots and re-sprig those plots, which we did. And in July 17th, you can actually see um, the, the arrow on the right is pointing directly at the plot, and the, at, at a spectacle treated plot, which has no weeds, if you'll notice, as well as uh, thinner turf. The, the arrow on the left is pointing at an untreated area, which the sprigs are coming back much more vigorously, but it's full of weeds as well. So you can still see the residual carryover from the spectacle that was applied in October the following June. Here's another image just showing it a little bit better. This is one month after the sprigging event. And as you look down those rows, you see dark green and then kind of light green, yellowish, and then dark green again. And you know, I've got the arrows pointing at these light green or yellowish plots. And uh, I've labeled them, you know, spectacle as a split three ounce followed by three ounce or spectacle as six ounce uh, up front. And arguably, Dr. Gannon, those, those aren't high rates. You know, those would be very reasonable recommended rates. And look, let me let me also say though that in this trial we got 100% cover of Bermuda grass in what I would argue was a reasonable time frame, even though we did see these effects from spectacle. But I'll also say we had this turf on a four irrigation events per day program continuously, so it was a best case scenario in terms of sprig establishment, and we were able to establish regardless. But we we did see at least some level of residual influence of the spectacle. Uh, it did not inhibit sprig establishment, but it was there. Right. I'll turn it over to Dr. Gannon for some work that he's got here. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is some work, and I'll preface this by saying uh, spectacle or endazoflam uh, is an excellent uh, herbicide, free herbicide. Um, and for those that may not be as familiar as others, you know, its, uh, its greatest attribute is also uh, its worst attribute. That being, it's, it's very, very persistent. When we think of pre-emergent herbicides that we use in, in many turf settings, if you take a prodiamine or a pendimethalin, uh, typically an average half-life, rather, uh, is, you know, 45 to 60 days. 
whereas an average half-life for endazoflam uh, is 120 to 150 days. And of course, that gets at the point uh, that Dr. Askey was making earlier with some of the seeding, reseeding and resodding uh, and sprigging uh, restrictions. But so the point of all that is that it, it's a it's an excellent herbicide. Uh, many it controls many common and troublesome broadleaf and annual, uh, or excuse me, broadleaf and grassy weeds. Uh, but again, if you get injury from anything and you have spectacle on the ground, uh, the reality of it is that you're going to be you're going to be dealing with injured turf uh, for a significant period of time, and particularly as you get up into Virginia. I mean, it's even hard for us in most of North Carolina to, to grow out of the injury in that in a, in a given year. And as you go north, of course, uh, that problem is exacerbated. An advanced slide. And this is just a picture um, of a golf course in Wilmington. That picture was in Wilmington, North Carolina, in the southeast corner of the state. And that picture uh, that we just saw was actually taken in like July 10th or July 11th. So um, again, you're going to be if you get injury from um, anything, if you have spectacle down, then you're, you're going to be looking at that injury for a significant period of time. And just some work that we did to kind of characterize uh, some of the stuff that we were seeing. This is uh, was done in 2012 uh, through 2014, again, in the Wilmington area. Uh, go ahead and advance. Looking at um, uh, application rates being three followed by three, 30, 30 days apart, three ounces followed by three ounces, 30 days apart, six, nine ounces, which is the nine to 10 ounces is the top. Uh, the labeled right now, we don't recommend applying that much in a single application, but nonetheless, it is labeled. We also included 12 ounces, which was labeled uh, on the old 20 WSP label, but is, is no longer labeled on the spectacle flow. So we looked at different application rates, different application timings, and in this particular uh, area, we had areas that were previously injured slash stressed. And that was from a uh, spectacle application the previous year as far as where we saw uh, injury and the stress in this particular uh, test was it was a moderate uh, nematode pressure area as well as a 40% the reduction in, uh, in sunlight in this particular area. So it was a, it was a, it was a shade line, so it was 40% reduction um, uh, in sunlight. Go ahead, next. And we won't we won't get into the data in great detail here, but across the bottom we see different rates uh, that we evaluated uh, across the uh, uh, across the y-axis. We have percent of grass cover, and the white bars being non-stressed, the yellow yellow bars being stressed. And this is year one. Again, even when we applied 12 ounces of product per acre, which is no longer currently labeled, we didn't see uh, didn't see differences with respect to Bermuda grass response or Bermuda grass cover. Next. However, in year two, um, we see that as we increased the rate in the stressed area, as we increased the spectacle rate uh, in the stressed areas, we got um, increased Bermuda grass damage or reduced Bermuda grass cover. Uh, th these particular data were taken 56 days after the, uh, after the April sequential application. Um, so again, on into the uh, on into the summer here, we had uh, significant reductions in Bermuda grass cover uh, in the stressed areas. So again, they weren't the same plots, but they were in adjacent areas. So you know, it begs the question: What's the difference between year one and year two? Okay. Uh, again, in, in year one, obviously, in Dazaplan did not adversely affect Bermuda grass, regardless of the system application or rate rate or timing. Excuse me. However, in year two, uh, we did see significant reductions, particularly in the in the stressed areas. And again, that begs the question: What was the difference? And again, this is in the Wilmington area, and this is uh, it looks intimidating, but it's very it's, it's quite simple. And uh, so, this is accumulated temperatures below freezing, as number of hours per day. And as you see here in year one, which is the black solid line, uh, it was a uh, a, a regular or a uh, normal year as far as uh, temperatures, whereas in year two, which was 2013 slash 14, uh, again it was a much colder year. So it's not that uh, it's not that endazoflam or spectacle alone caused the Bermuda grass injury, but again in this particular area it was a colder winter, 
as well as there was uh, reduction in, in sunlight as a shaded area, as well as there was a moderate uh, nematode pressure area. So the, the point is, next, the point is when, and you know, we're talking about spectacle here, um, and we've kind of used spectacle as a surrogate, if you will, for, for free herbicides. But when we're, when we're thinking about free herbicides and, and utilizing these in our management programs, uh, you know, uh, I've got the comment here, avoid using pesticides with herbicides, namely with inconsistent turf grass tolerance, and particularly in areas with poor growth conditions and or in newly renovated or established areas. And again, you know, the poor growth conditions that we talk about, you know, areas prone to winter injury, that's germane to what we're talking about now, but traffic, shade, nematodes, all these, um, you know, it, it, it exacerbates. So it's not that in diazoplan, in some cases it can injure Bermuda grass alone, alone, but more commonly what happens is we get injury from some other uh, event or some other combination of events. And when we have a diazoplan on the ground, it, it prohibits it from, um, from lateral spread and recovery, and we end up with unacceptable turf quality. And again, as you get up into, in, into Virginia, um, that's exacerbated even more. Um, and it, it's, it's difficult. If you get injury uh, and you have spectacle on the ground, it's difficult to grow out of it within that particular season. So from a management standpoint, it would stand to reason that zone treating, like trying to identify these poor growth areas uh, on your golf course or on whatever type of area you're managing. And then, uh, yeah, uh, Ron Star is four times the cost, but, you know, try to use something like a shoot inhibitor, like uh, oxidizon in those areas, and then save the spectacle for more uh, less stressed areas, and you're probably going to dodge most of your issues. Right. And this is just uh, another picture uh, showing an entranceway to a cart path and, you know, products like Spectacle uh, that inhibit lateral spread and recovery. Uh, areas like this, as well as on athletic fields, par 3 tees, you know, and Dazaflam type materials, because of their uh, mode of action, because of their persistence, uh, it should never be used in, a, uh, in an area similar to this. You know, the exact place we need it to keep that goose grass out. You don't see any goose right. grass there. <laughs> right. And that picture, just for your information, uh, for everyone's information, that picture was taken in Hawaii 14 months after a spectacle application. Wow. So, so again, just to, uh, to recircle, if you will, um, you know, it, it, it makes sense uh, or it's intuitive uh, for product, for all pre-herbicides, but again, you know, uh, and azaflam is the poster here because of its persistence. It makes more sense to use more caution uh, if using it for summer annual weed control. Having said that, you know, we've done a lot of work, as have others, uh, uh, in the southeast U.S. And, you know, if you, if you, get, if you observe adverse effects from endazoflam applications, we've also seen it from, uh, from fall applications as well. Um, you know, contrary to oxidizing-type product uh, programs, excuse me, um, you know, with endazoflam and the DNAs, uh, you know, timely split applications help both from a tolerance standpoint as well as a weed control standpoint. Again, these products are never recommended in newly established areas or saturated soils uh, and or stressed turf. And, you know, again, that includes areas that are, you know, prone to particularly, you know, winter injury. And I also add before we switch gears, you know, one of the questions that I have, and Sean, you may have some comments here, is, uh, you know, SureGuard or Flumioxazin, um, you know, we get some questions about it. And to my knowledge, the work, I mean, it carries an eight week uh, seeding or sodding restriction on the label. There is nothing on there about sprigging, to my knowledge. But, right. you know, we don't, we don't have the answers to that question. I don't know if you had any. We, we've had comments. some trials that uh, we got troubling uh, injury in one of five different application timings. Um, and, and so in all cases, SureGuard was applied the day before sprigging. And in one of those instances, we had severe injury. I've talked to some folks at New Farm, and um, they kind of indicated that um, although it's not impossible to have a little bit of injury, 
severe injury like what we saw was uncommon. So I'm not sure, but suffice it to say that um, I, I would argue that with SureGuard, you would probably be much safer to, to put a couple of weeks between application and sprigging, unlike what we do with uh, Ronstar, which can be same day. Uh, and it's probably related to, you know, with bo both of those products, you can have water splash uh, soil that contains the product up onto the leaves, and you get that shoot inhibitory or that injury effect. And perhaps that's uh, more prevalent with the flumioxazin that's in SureGuard, but um, the, some of the company folks told me from a sprigging standpoint, a couple of weeks separation between application and sprigging should suffice. And that product comes in at a price point, it's about half, uh, or maybe a little more than half of what uh, Ronstar would be. Now, that's not counting a lot of the generic uh, oxidizon, so, but anyway, it's a little bit cheaper price point. And, um, but it doesn't have the longevity or the residual, particularly on goosegrass, that oxidizon would. Uh, but it should be good enough in, the, in Virginia, if you're applying the product in late February, to take you through the bulk of the season. I think it's worth a look um, in the Virginia area, but I'm told the further south you go, the harder it is for two reasons. One, they often will have more green Bermuda grass, and a post-emerge application of uh, SureGuard is going to brown all that right back out, which is not good. Uh, uh, and the fact that you have to move it closer to the summer season to get the length of residual that's needed exacerbates that issue, where the Bermuda grass is even more green in the deep south. So it limits the application of SureGuard in the southern areas. Right, Dr. Gannon? Uh, I agree, yes. And Travis, for uh, Dr. Askew's heard me tell this story, but uh, Ronstar Oxidizon certainly got some great applications here, but one of the most complete kills, unintentional kills of Bermuda graft that I've ever seen was with the sprayable formulation of uh, Oxidizon several years ago uh, that was not followed up with an irrigation event. There was supposed to be a rainfall event that didn't occur mid-transition. And I have never seen such thoroughly killed Bermuda grass, even with the Roundup application, as what I saw that day. I think it speaks yeah, to what Dr. Grady said uh, in that uh, in the spring, if you want to see sensitivity, whether it's zoysia, Bermuda, it doesn't matter. If you want to see sensitivity to any stress, uh, put it out in the spring when those plants are just greening up, and that's that's when you're going to see it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, and we, we I haven't seen it on Bermuda grass, but I've seen it countless times on perennial ryegrass, and we, we tell our managers uh, don't count on rainfall. Well, I mean, we, I mean, spraying oxidizing or Ronstar is, is difficult for that very reason. Uh, you know, many of the irrigation systems are winterized, and, you know, it, if that irrigation system isn't running immediately after the application, you know, you're, you're really, really rolling the dice, particularly on ryegrass, perennial ryegrass. Yeah, on Bermuda, most often what I see is a bronze coloration that'll come on about four days after application. It'll persist about two to two and a half weeks, but then when it goes away, you get a rebound effect and you're really in business. So it's noticeable, but it's not that big of a deal. So we got a new question here. Um, would this be a good year to consider late application of post-emerge herbicides and avoid the pre altogether no. uh, once the weeds are visible? And you can also determine what the Bermuda grass is doing, um, or would, would you do that post-emerge along with a pre-emerge? Um, yeah, I mean, one option, and I, and I was actually, that's a segue into this, uh, the information on the slide right now is post-emerge products. And we've done a little bit of work looking at that. Uh, from an athletic standpoint, uh, our athletic field managers seldom have the luxury of using residual pre-emerge herbicides, so they're all trying to manage with very short-lived residuals or with all post-emerge herbicides. So one tactic on a budget to deal with winter kill issues is using a, a cheap product like uh, Prodiamine, you can go out with a half rate. So if you went out with a half rate now with your Roundup, that's going to carry you at least into our spring green up and early summer season and give you appreciable crab and goose suppression, but it's not enough that it's going to persist. By the time that you definitely have a read on how much winter kill you have, you should be able to sprig into uh, a, a lower rate, something like 12, um, maybe even to 24 ounces of per diamine. What do you think about that, Dr. Gannon? 
Yeah, I, I agree, and I think it's uh, you know if you're if you're not able to afford oxidizing based programs this year, I think that's your best best uh, best plan. Yeah, I mean it's not the it's not Cadillac. Oxidizing really right. would be the best way to go, but it, on a budget, it, it could definitely and that'll take you into the early part of the season. Your sprig take might not be quite as fast, but it's it's probably going to be pretty good. At that point, though, you're going to be depending on um, post-emerge herbicides to grow those sprigs in. And Revolver, Tribute Total, and Carfentrazone are some of the safest products. The, the Quicksilver Carfentrazone, uh, that's a really good product for broadleaf. I typically wouldn't recommend it because it's fairly expensive and it's only going to address seedlings. But if you have an explosion of seedling broadleaf weeds, then it's worth the application to free up that space for your sprigs to grow in. Revolver and Tribute Total both are going to give you broad spectrum suppression of grass, broadleaf, and sedge weeds in the case of Tribute Total, but they, they do come at a, at a cost, uh, price-wise. Yeah. Randy, there's a question that popped up that I can't see. Can you share that one? Well, the last one that I have was one y'all just read. Would this be a good year to use very late application of post-emergence once weeds are visible and Bermuda is actively growing okay. along with pre-emergence? Yeah, we just had one. If y'all send it again, there was one I saw for Diamond. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, send it to all good. participants, and that way we'll be able to see it here. But I saw one on Prodiamine and overseeding. Whoever sent it, please try again. Oh yeah, we'll get to that in just a moment. Here's, uh, you know, our market-leading post-emergence crabgrass product is Drive. And uh, you can see that drive is in the foreground. We've got another very popular product for cool season grasses, which is Pilex. It carries some limited uh, registration in Bermuda grass as well. And you can see that in the background here. Both of those are very injurious to Bermuda grass. And I would argue in Virginia, especially in a situation like an athletic field, uh, we just don't have the time or the heat units in the season to be playing around with injurious products. Uh, and that's why I would probably spend the money on something like Revolver or Tribute Total and catch the weeds when they're very young uh, to avoid having this type of injury because that type of injury can persist for two to three weeks. Here's that question. Should we use a Prodiamine product for Bermuda grass that was overseeded with rye in the fall, softball fields and parks and rec department? Uh, for, I guess, for softball fields, for outfields, things like that, you can definitely get away with that. that. That shouldn't be an issue. Again, I wouldn't use high rates because what we're concerned about this year is winter kill. And once you uh, get ready, if you're gonna transition that rye, you might find that there's not a strong Bermuda base under it. So you don't want anything inhibiting the potential to put sprigs out. So that half X rate? Yeah, so that half X rate. But if you're gonna maintain a two grass system and you're not necessarily worried about your Bermuda base, which that would be uncommon, um, then yeah, there, there's no issue there with using the Prodiamine on the recently overseeded uh, ryegrass from last fall, using the Prodiamine this spring. Yeah, as long as it's up and growing and it's got a deep root system, shouldn't be an issue. Here's crabgrass suppression. Now the plants were a bit bigger than I would have wanted them to be at the time of application in this scenario. What Tribute Total often will do, this is at 3.2 ounces, is it'll stick those plants right where they were on the day of application. Young plants, it'll kill them, crab and goose. It's a little bit stronger on goose than it is on crab. But if the plants are multi-tiller, usually it's not going to kill them outright. It's going to stunt them. And uh, the beauty of it, though, is they'll, they'll remain stunted for over six weeks. And oftentimes in Virginia, that's long enough to get us into the end of the season. We don't have much season as it is. In that uh, study that we were looking at for sprig establishment, here's products that work pretty well. And again, you see Revolver and Tribute Total rounding out the bulk of those. Notice how Revolver was 17 ounces plus drive, how much that lowered, uh, actually, I'm sorry, that uh, we're looking at control here of goosegrass. Yeah, that's a point that I wanted to make, that the drive actually uh, antagonized the control with the Revolver. We've done a lot of work trying to get all-in-one combinations to get crabgrass and goose. And Revolver is far superior on goosegrass than it is on crab, but adding drive is not a good idea there. You can see with that bottom line there, lowering the control. Have you ever seen that, Dr. Gannon? We have, yes. And yeah. then uh, here's some products that didn't work so well. Um, we hear a lot about Speed Zone, and there's been a lot of people that have had really good success with Speed Zone on goosegrass, uh, using it on Bermuda. 
Uh, the key to getting that to work is repeat applications at two-week intervals. Uh, some of the best programs, though, that I've seen were the full rate at two-week intervals, which is off-label. Um, when you lower the rate to try to meet label requirements, uh, it, it becomes more of a struggle. The plants better be a little bit younger. Dismiss is a good suppressant, and there's a Dismiss Syncor program on there, but they just, uh, again, plant size has to be small for these type programs to work, and Drive is never going to address goosegrass. Here's just a few images from a different trial showing how at sprigging, uh, now this would be, say, day of, uh, applying Ronstar on the day of as a granular. This is, at sprigging is the only situation in which I would recommend lowering the Ronstar rate relative to what the label's telling you. I think most people out in the field are doing it anyway because of price. But uh, in this case, you can see from 100 pounds of Ronstar to 150, and 150 being the high label rate for sprigging, uh, 200 is the high label rate for mature turf. But at 150, we do see a, diff see a difference in the establishment rate. Now, I would also make the argument though, don't hide behind a weed for fear of a herbicide. I often see people ignoring heavy weed pressure, which is also, everything's green because there's weeds out there, but those weeds are slowing down your establishment rate just like 150 pounds of Ronstar might. Uh, but anyway, about 125 pounds of Ronstar is my recommendation for sprigging. And you can see Drive in this situation, I think Drive applied timely soon after sprigging before the real growth starts can be a, time, a good application uh, for an establishment event. But once you're up and going and the sprigs are actually growing and producing laterals, uh, Drive will take out about three weeks of your season. So take those couple weeks out before the sprigs wake up and really kick in. Otherwise, drive, I think, is too injurious. Yeah, and Dr. Ask, I'll, I'll add to that. With the drive, uh, with the lower rates, um, you know, I think you got some marginal tolerance there early on, but it is, we saw with a lot of the seeded cultivars, uh, it's been about 10 years ago, we haven't worked with them more recently, but um, you really need to apply drive alone early post-emergence at the half rates. In other words, don't apply it uh, right. with an adjuvant. The other thing to add to that slide uh, is, you know, don't forget about MSMA for those that can still use it. You can use early post-emergence on sprigs. You can use uh, half rates of MSMA, so a pound active uh, of MSMA, and, you know, it's going to take repeat applications, but that's also a good treatment early post if you're in newly sprigged areas. Oh, that was the that was the biggest loss uh, was in athletics where you know we're always having to sprig to to recover from wear. The loss of MSMA was very painful in that segment of the market. And yes, it applies. Sure. You're right. It applies very well to winter kill situations as well. Anytime you grow. I think, I think Dr. Miller's already shown us his handiwork here in doing this. But of course, part of what you've got to do is to start assessing where you are at. So be sure to pull some of these samples from your. Uh, supposed problem areas, and uh, you'll quite quickly know, again, within a week's time, if you don't see appreciable greening, then you've got a pretty good idea that you've got some significant damage there. So there's nothing that's too elaborate involved in pulling some samples and checking for what your recovery rates are going to be. And it doesn't have to be fancy. Pull them, put them in a windowsill. Uh, we've talked to several turf managers that have already done that on both Bermuda and Zoysia in Virginia. And despite how much we may have uh, scared you all with this webinar today, everyone that I've talked to, except for what Dr. Miller just showed us, has gotten a full green up uh, from, but most, they were all, the ones that I'm talking about were all fairway samples, not, none of them were greens. Now, in checking the herbicide residual, that second bullet there, what would you put that, would it be ryegrass seed? What's the quickest way to assess? Yeah, uh, uh, ryegrass is a quick germinator uh, and, arguably would be able to show you if there's appreciable residual. Um, so, yeah, you can, yeah, ryegrass would probably be the best. Okay. It's so fast. Lettuce, lettuce maybe, but a lot of our pre-emerge herbicides, uh, lettuce is going to jump up very rapidly, but a lot of our pre-emerge herbicides are fairly weak on broadly. Spectacle would, would take lettuce out no problem, but prodiamine would have a problem with it. So as we kind of tie this part together and be thinking about your questions for us here uh, to what you'd like to ask while you've got this group of folks around. But we talked about, you know, the potential. And again, as Sean said, most of what we're seeing even here in Virginia 
a colder state, and even further north into Maryland, as most people are telling me they're still very optimistic that, hey, I'm seeing a lot of green tissue out there. So do keep that in mind. But if we do have damage, and this is always one of the ones that really concerns me, and great if you have a comment here, I always tell people, remember the sod farms uh, aren't immune to the damage as well. And if we have that type of winter, quite often that's where it gets interesting is if our people that are providing sod and sprigs have appreciable damage because uh, I know a few folks that were protecting some things with covers, but that's not the norm for hundreds of acres. So uh, it's one of these be uh, paying attention and start thinking about uh, if you think you're going to need grass, you might want to be uh, talking about that sooner rather than later. Great. Any comment there? Has that ever been an issue you've seen during your career? Yeah, I've seen it a couple of times. Uh... And the lucky thing is, is you know you can ship sod from further south, so sometimes you have to go a little further to find it. True. We had a uh, we had a big turf symposium in Atlanta. It was all the deep south weed scientists were there, and, and there was a lot of concern. There were there were some comments made that they believe that they're going to see winter kill at least in some fashion all the way to the coast. Uh, probably it's going to be limited to folks that tend to not cover their greens and for years have been able to get away with it. Uh, and maybe we won't see any problems because as Dr. Miller said, and I think you've alluded to Dr. Goatley, a lot of times this winter kill issue is more associated with what happens in spring once the plants start to try to wake up. That's when they're really, really Yeah, positive. Grady's already said it, and that's the last bullet here is don't be in too big of a hurry yet because I agree with uh, what Grady said earlier. In my opinion, it's we usually get more spring kill we do winter kill and it's about the time the grass really starts waking up that something happens and that's where we really get hit so it's kind of a, a cumulative effect that we see i tell people also in the world of seeded bermuda grasses uh again if you go that route think about how that is impacted uh by the use of these trees because their ron star is no longer an option Good for point. you in terms of if you're going to use seed and even as the, the improved uh, seeded bermuda grasses uh, zoysia grasses, are they available? And if so, what's the price that you're paying for? Something for those of you who have been following these uh, Turf Grass Tuesday, and we'll be talking about this, and we've been doing quite a bit of research the last few years here, is uh, dormant sprigging. Uh, Mike Skelton is one of our uh, sports field managers up in Culpeper, and Mike's going to be speaking in March during our Turf Grass Tuesday. And he's been working with me on uh, doing both dormant seeding and dormant sprigging trials. And we've had a great bit of success. So it is an option, as crazy as it might sound, that uh, we've already put our 2018 trials, the first uh, January trial went in about three weeks ago. And again, much tougher winter this year than last year, but uh, I'm anticipating that we'll probably be able to grow off uh, Bermuda grass sprigs that were planted in January in Blacksburg as we did last year. Time will tell. And when you finally kind of know what you've got, hopefully you're past those last freezing dates, et cetera, I tell people you need to be prepared to fertilize and mow these grasses and basically in some instances treat this as if it is a grow-in. Manage your traffic, manage your irrigation, and especially in, in terms of sports fields and heavily trafficked areas on golf courses, do something that's going to regulate that turf use until that establishment is as far along as it can possibly be. Grady, I'll shut up for a second and let you and chime in here if you have anything else to add about this. No, I agree wholeheartedly. Good comments. We got one more comment um, from the crowd. Uh, you know, we have to get by Easter. It seems in our area that's the magic date to get through for cold. So yeah, know your know your frost free date um, because anything can happen in, up until that point. Yeah, that, one of the most uh, dramatic winter kill scenarios that we've had in Blacksburg since I've been here was a situation where we actually it was an early spring. Things had really greened up, and I will uh, remember it was a spring game for Virginia Tech. Everything was juiced, uh, ryegrass looking great, but Bermuda grass underneath of it well on the way, and we went down into the uh, low teens as temperatures, and that was the first time on the game field that we really saw there was some appreciable winter kill. Uh, and again, to that point in time, we thought we were in great shape. So keep the questions coming in for us. We've still got a few more minutes that we can go. Uh, as we wait for any questions that come in, I'll remind uh, in anyone that wants to listen, especially anyone from the world of sports turf, that March 20th uh, will be our next Turfgrass Tuesday webinar, and that is going to feature the aforementioned Mike Skelton 
of Culpeper Parts and Rec. And I've partnered with Mike a couple of times now at STMA and VSTMA programs uh, and said, you need to do this talk. Uh, he calls it doing more with less in sports turf management. And Mike does some pretty amazing things there in Culpeper with uh, a very limited budget. So anyone in the world of sports turf uh, can pick up a few tips from Mike and probably also share some with us. Uh, other things coming up here in the near future in Virginia is come to the Bay at the Virginia Beach Resort and Hotel Conference Center. That's February 27th and 28th. Our VSTMA Field Day is taking place at Mike's facility, Culpeper Park, uh, April 25th. And Come to the Valley is another Virginia Turfgrass Council sponsored event which happens at the Frontier Culture Museum of Stanton, Virginia, May 8th and 9th. And finally, our biggest uh, research fundraising event of the year is our Virginia Golf Turf Field Day and Golf Tournament, which this year is taking place at Independence in Midlothian, May 21st. Anything to add about that, Jordan? No, we're excited to have uh, a lot of teams out on the 21st and uh, raise a lot of money for research and uh, kind of show off the new facility there. So we're excited about it and um, just kind of following up on a couple things. You know, right now seems to be the critical time whether you're making that decision, oxidizing, glyphosate, things like that. Dr. Askew, anything about application in those, you know, sort of gallonage or, you know, talking about uh, volume and... Well, general, general rules of thumb for glyphosate, try to go low volume. You know, that's a that situation where we do not want to fall into our fungicide paradigm of two gallons per thousand. You, you want to be half gallon per thousand but with glyphosate. Anything you can do to minimize the amount of spray that penetrates down into the canopy because that's where the green leaves are. We want to minimize contact with green leaves. We want to hit the pole annua and the winter weeds that are on top of that canopy. So low volume tends to work real well uh, with glyphosate. Tank mix combinations tend to do well. Products that have activity on POA, I have sometimes seen to antagonize glyphosate on POA. Uh, so that would include SureGuard, uh, which oftentimes though these combinations, uh, SureGuard is going to kill the POA either way and glyphosate may kill the POA either way. SureGuard can be inconsistent depending on POA size, though. Uh, spectacle. Spectacle combos with glyphosate I've seen, too, because spectacle has a little bit of post-merge activity on POA. Sometimes it can pull down the activity of the glyphosate a little bit. So separating the applications would be a, you know, a very laborious way to combat that. And, and I can't predict whether it's going to happen to you or not, but it, it's a possibility. Um, but, yeah, and you're right, now, now's the time. It, it, just trying to dodge the weather and get out there and get the stuff on. We're dormant. Uh, we're good to go. Just try to be low rates on your root inhibitors if you're using those, or go to a shoot inhibitor like Ronstar. So sure. Dr. Sure. Miller, Dr. Gannon, any dates for, of upcoming events from your all's perspective? I'm going to have Sean read a question here in a second, but anything coming up that you all would like to broadcast? Yeah, on March the 13th, we have our Western uh, Turf Conference, which is a mainly a landscape, uh, sports turf, park and rec conference. It's in Flat Rock, North Carolina, just south of Asheville. Uh, and, and registrations via our Turf Files website are normally a normal website we use for, for information. And then, as always, our, our large field day each year is the second Wednesday of August uh, in, in Raleigh. So... Second Wednesday of August, you know, come and join us with uh, 800 of your closest friends on a nice, warm August day. So happy to have you all come down. I think Sean and I would come if you could promise us it would be in the upper 70s. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that description, nice, warm uh, August day. La last oh, year, we got... had great weather. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, mm -hmm. we've only gotten bit once out of the last five years, but that's rolling the dice. All right, Dr. Askew has another question here. So we Sean, do have, yes, we do have another question. Uh, comment, been using Pilex at rates of 0.1 ounce per acre or lower on cool season turf to control goosegrass. Any research on how rates this low may be usable on Bermuda when actively growing in the summer? That could be an entirely new webinar. Yes. Um, we, we have done a lot of work in this area. There, there has been a recent label change to Pilex that allows for its use on Bermuda grass. In the, in the deep south, uh, those rates can go as high as three quarters of an ounce, and in our area, they can go as high as a half ounce. I can tell you in either of those scenarios, you're going to have snow white Bermuda grass for the better part of two weeks. Uh, we're typically recommending something right about what you have there, 0.1 ounces to 0.25 ounces on Bermuda grass, 
And in Virginia, at those rates, you are going to see white Bermuda grass for a substantial amount of time. Chelated iron, um, in, in many cases, has improved the speed at which the Bermuda recovers from that injury. But for us, it has not reduced the severity of the injury when you get it. Uh, our favorite program in that arena on Bermuda is 0.15 ounces Pilex and 4 ounces Syncor. That combination for us, on some Bermuda cultivars, it, it, it's still pretty darn injurious, but it's the best balance that we've gotten for killing large goosegrass plants, but minimizing the period of injury that you're going to be dealing with, depending on the Bermuda cultivar you have. And cool season turf, injury is not the issue uh, at those rates those low. And yes, those low rates will get goosegrass, but they will not get crabgrass. You're going to have to get up well above a half ounce per acre to get crabgrass post emerge with Pilex. All right, well, we want to thank in particular Dr. Gannon and Dr. Miller for taking time to join us. It's always a pleasure to partner with our colleagues from other states. Uh, you guys did great today, uh, and we expanded this, uh, this event to uh, some new states in terms of doing that. So we appreciate everyone that was able to join us around. We'd really appreciate if you give us a few minutes of your time to complete the survey, which will automatically come up, give us some feedback on what did or did not work. And we hope that uh, those of you, especially from the world of sports turf, that uh, you'll join us on March 20th for that special webinar that will feature Mike Skelton on doing more for less. Grady, Travis, any last thing you guys would like to say? Let's hope for an early spring and it stays that way. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Travis.